So my name is Marcia Castro. Um, I am the Endelot Professor of Demography at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And it is my great honor to introduce our speaker today, Professor Brian Farrell. Brian is the director of the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies that we call Dr. Class. He's the Monique and Philip Lenner Professor for the Study of Latin America in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology here at Harvard. He's the Curator in Entomology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology and the Faculty Dean of the Leverett House at the College. Brian is an authority on coevolution between insects and plants. His studies have shown that some of their associations have co-evolved since before dinosaurs up to today and produced the most diverse groups of species in modern biomes. He is currently studying the co-evolution of mosquitoes, their hosts, and the pathogens that connect them. For more than 20 years, Brian has also spearheaded initiatives to digitize scientific specimens in museums for free sharing via the internet and is involved in educational projects that use those images. And the images are phenomenal. If you haven't seen them, you should take a look. Uh, Brian was a Fulbright Scholar to the University Autonoma um, in Santo Domingo in the Dominican Republic. He has a BA in zoology and botany from the University of Vermont and a master's and a PhD from the University of Maryland. Today, Brian is gonna talk about everything we touch, touches us back, culture, biology, and health. And this talk is timely, and I think it's timely for two reasons. First, for almost 10 years, Brian has been directing Dr. Class and he touched the center by bringing science much closer to the center activities. And I am sure he was touched by the center's depth and breadth of disciplines, cultures, and knowledge. Second, the COVID pandemic, the reason why we will all listen to the director's talk remotely and not at the beautiful Sci Auditorium is an example of the impacts that our relationships with nature and with each other can cause. To shed light on those complex relationships, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Brian Farrell. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia, for such a wonderful introduction. Um, I'm gonna just, uh, let me t tell you a little bit by way of introduction that uh, the material that you hear, I I'm not really an expert on any of these topics. I I'm simply, um, you know, an educated lay person in this way, but, uh, along with you all. And I've been teaching uh, classes to undergraduates for about 25 years here at Harvard. And it's really their questions and interests that uh, spurred me to read more broadly than I ever would have. And, uh, you know, think about um, our place in nature. Uh, it's a time-honored uh, question in evolutionary biology, as well as in philosophy and and theology, uh, and uh, see if I can't, uh, couldn't um, make some sense of the connections that uh, that that I was be beginning to see, and I'm very excited to share with you uh, that are coming to light, especially in the last ten years or so. So um, along the way, a couple of years ago, I published a, a I actually sort of uh, guest edited a uh, an issue of Revista, our Harvard Review of Latin America, from Dr. Class, and it was an issue uh, dedicated to the biology of culture, and I. Uh, contributed something myself, and there were a number of other individuals from around the world uh, also contributing from around Latin America. I'll also say that, uh, as Marcia said, my experience with the humanities and social sciences uh, across the schools of Harvard uh, through Dr. Class has really been extremely helpful in um, spurring new questions and, and seeing new connections. And so I'm really delighted to be here with you today to share some of that. So I think. Uh, you all know who this is. This is a young uh, Pablo Picasso, uh, one of the creative icons of the 20th century. Um, pa among many other things, Picasso was well known for being able to take a, pick up a pencil and capture the essence of a camel with a single line. Uh, so he was a master of abstraction. And this is how he summarized this view. You may also know Richard Feynman, another creative icon of the 20th century in the sciences. Dick Feynman developed this diagram, also a simple abstraction of a complex reality. It captures all of the fates 
forward and backward in time, subatomic sub particles after collision. It, now the Feynman diagrams are a standard uh, practice uh, for pedagogy across physics disciplines. So he also had this perspective that, uh, you know, science, uh, a scientist needs to be comfortable with varying degrees of certainty about the world. Nothing is absolutely known for sure. And that's a perspective that that'll inform uh, today's talk as well as, as a complement uh, to that of, uh, of Pablo Picasso. Uh, Feynman uh, later in his life took art lessons and I'd like to begin with this uh, quote, which you can also find the interview on, online on YouTube. So he says, you know, I have a friend who's an artist and he is sometimes taking a view which, which I don't agree with very well. He'll hold up a flower and say, oh, look how beautiful it is. And, and I'll agree. And, and then he says, you know, I as an artist can see how beautiful this is, but you as a scientist, you take this all apart and it becomes a dull thing. And Feynman says, well, you know, I think that's kind of nutty actually, but first of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too, I believe. Uh, although I may not be quite as refined aesthetically as he is, I can appreciate the beauty of a flower. Uh, at the same time, I see much more about the flower than he sees. I, I can imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions inside, which also have a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension at one centimeter, it's also beauty at its smaller dimensions, the inner structure, also the processes, the fact that the, the colors in the flower evolved in order to attract insects to pollinate it. It's interesting. It means that the insects can see the color. It also adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the lower forms? That is the insects. Why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions, which the science knowledge only adds to the excitement, the mystery and the awe of the flower. It only adds. I don't understand how it subtracts. That's not an old um, tension. It was uh, manifest in an exchange between John Keats, uh, the early English uh, naturalist poet, uh, and Sir Isaac Newton. Uh, Keats had uh, chided Newton, who had just shown that uh, the colors of a rainbow could be brought back into white light by using a prism. He charged that, uh, Keats charged that Newton had robbed some of the romance out of the beauty of a rainbow. Uh, and it's sort of the, by, by this kind of demonstration of science. Uh, so that was the, the tension that was even, um, you know, uh, true back then, 200 years ago. Uh, I like the more prosaic uh, view, very straightforward. My favorite author, E.B. White. Dissecting a joke is like dissecting a frog. Very few people are interested in it, and the frog dies. The same idea. So the science question that we might pose for today, uh, which uh, is, you know, addresses the origins of the arts is, uh, do we have an innate template for culture? And I, I borrow this uh, from Noam Chomsky, who suggested way back when that we ha might have an innate template for language that would populate with vocabulary and grammar. Well, I think it might be broader than that, and you'll see why in a moment. And of course, uh, Keats had his own uh, take on the relationship between, you know, knowledge and, and aesthetics. Uh, you know, truth is beauty and beauty truth. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. Now, uh, I'm going to step back a little bit uh, first um, to our ancestors 30, 40,000 years ago, and then further still uh, to just see where does this idea of culture come from and to what extent is it manifest back then and, 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 and continue till today. So the, uh, the caves of Altamira, Spain were the first uh, cave paintings discovered by, uh, you know, by Europeans. Um, back in 1880, a, a young girl uh, brought her father in uh, to a cave into the deep uh, inner recesses where his uh, candlelight illuminated these extraordinary, uh, beautiful depictions of bison in all sorts of poses and with nuanced uh, treatments of their muscles and all. And, and in fact, they were so extraordinary that uh, he approached the leading archeologists of the day and uh, shared uh, this discovery, but it was uniformly doubted. No one really thought that those could have been uh, as old as he claimed they, they were. Uh, they must be a fraud, must be a forgery from today. And that was largely because their mindset was that we knew that there were um, early humans around 10,000 or more years ago, but no one had the idea that they would be capable of such sophisticated depictions of such sophisticated art. In fact, it's once been, it's been said that Picasso walking into these caves, uh, you know, uh, decades ago said that, you know, walked out shaking, shaking his head. So, you know, we haven't learned anything uh, that is new since, since then. So the world wasn't prepared with, for the idea that our human ancestors were capable of this kind of sophisticated art. It wasn't until a few decades later that they wandered into France and they saw 
more caves with more extra extraordinary paintings. These are the caves of Chauvet discovered in the 90s, but they were looking at the caves of Lascaux and others. And of course, since then, these cave paintings have been found all over the world. Uh, and they are extraordinary and they are much older than uh, folks even thought then. So it was the caves of France that finally convinced the world that early humans, uh, our ancestors, were capable of this kind of sophisticated, uh, really uh, nuanced depictions of, of their worlds. Now we know, of course, much more than we did than we have discovered uh, in Germany, this, this extraordinary imaginative uh, uh, representations. This is the lion man, uh, head of a lion, body of a man, uh, carved out of ivory. Uh, it's not clear what it might have represented, of course. Uh, this has been known for a couple of decades now. And uh, just this last fall, uh, the, uh, the journal Science reported this other uh, depiction here of the cave from the caves of Sulawesi of uh, antelope-headed hunters chasing this, the, the native bison there in the, in the rainforest. So this kind of imaginative art, not rep representing the world as accurately as possible, but rather combining things in some apparently meaningful way is, uh, is, a, is a tradition that goes back some 40,000 years or longer. Now, uh, one of the, there's several uh, uh, in my readings, uh, so, several discoveries that really changed the way I think about the world. And, and that's one, this is another. Uh, the, the, those extraordinary rooms of Europe and, and elsewhere, which are painted uh, with these depictions of animals uh, and sometimes humans, those are not the only rooms in these large cave systems. There are the acoustically resonant rooms. So those apparently um, are the rooms which the, our ancestors uh, chose to decorate. So that's hit me like a ton of bricks, as it were, um, because I realized that that's what performance halls, halls are today. We've been sitting together for 40, 50, 100,000 years, listening to, to music, as you'll see in a moment, uh, watching performance in this kind of setting, which enhances the overall sensation of community and of sharing, you know, an extraordinary uh, depiction or representation or whatever it is, an audiovisual display of sorts. So I think that's quite, quite extraordinary. These are some of the uh, flutes that have been found near those caves, uh, 37,000 years old, carved of ivory and following a diatonic scale. Uh, there are quite a number of these uh, and also drumsticks as well. So pipes and drums were the earliest uh, uh, musical instruments. Uh, this uh, at the lower uh, left might actually also be a flute created uh, not by our uh, Homo sapiens, but rather by Neanderthal. Uh, men are humans uh, back uh, even longer ago than uh, these more recent flutes. Uh. Now, who created all of this? Uh, you, you know, you have all probably been aware, as I have for quite some time, of uh, these walls of, of hands. So these were the hands that created these other things, uh, including these paintings and the musical instruments. Well, the hands are found all over the world. And uh, this uh, it happens, this particular example happens to come from Argentina. Uh, these uh, hands, um, you know, they're very striking. They're obviously decorative. And uh, I happened to come across this photograph. I was aware of the European ones, but not those in Argentina until uh, a, uh, a until a, a school fair that my at my son's school about uh, I guess uh, something like 15 years ago, in which an Argentine mother brought in this 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 book opened up this page, and I saw this. And for some reason, at that moment, it occurred to me how many are left hands? And so I counted them up. It turns out about 80 to 85% are left hands. Now, why is that? It's because the makers were right-handed. Because the way you make these things is you hold um, a uh, hollow stick loaded with some kind of pigment in your dominant hand, and then you put your other hand on the wall, and then you blow the powder onto your other hand. And so most of the hands are left because most of the makers were right-handed. Well, now we know from further evidence, in fact, that the artists were um, large, not just largely right-handed, but they were mostly were, were women. Uh, so you can tell that by the proportions of the fingers and, and other, uh, other measurements. Um, so that, that has just, that's a bit of an insight that's just come out in the past few months. Uh, extraordinary. So we're learning bit by bit about the creators. They were probably the creators of the cave art as well. 
Now that uh, a, a wonderful uh, set, se several books actually came out about the same time uh, the, uh, on various aspects of the biology of, of, the, of, of culture and on music in particular all around 2005. And there's a wonderful uh, uh, PBS special as well called The Music Instinct uh, that I'd invite you to see. And, and in fact, uh, Steve Mythen here, our author uh, is a contributor. So Steve uh, at this point in 2005, uh, wrote this book about uh, the singing Neanderthals, as you can see, and w musing on what the functions might have been, uh, and certainly the, the functions of their crania, which are very resonant, it turns out, and the functions of music, uh, which uh, serve two purposes uh, in other species and in our own as well. They, they serve in social cohesion to keep groups together, keep us on the same page. You know, uh, we, can, we certainly respond to musicians, their laments or their joys on stage uh, as, a, as a community, and of course, course, they also probably have some advantages uh, in uh, mating rituals as well. Everyone knows the stories about rock musicians, right? Okay, so uh, I'd invite you to read further there. Now, uh, it, not just um, the ancestors of, uh, of our particular uh, line of humans that produce this kind of culture, but now we know that Neanderthals were producing these things as well. In fact, some of the very oldest cave paintings were produced by Neanderthals. This is an abstraction on the right of the actual painting on the left. Here and those are by no means the oldest uh, uh, artistic or uh, cultural manifestations uh, out there. Uh, these are uh, up to a hundred thousand years old, found in South Africa. These geometric carvings, no one knows what they mean, whether they're a counting system or what they are. But there they are. Uh, also recently come to light as this uh, apparently ritual circle of stalagmites and stalactites broken off that are here arranged in a circle in this cave and that was inhabited by Neanderthals. So Neanderthals are rapidly becoming far from the brutish sorts that they were depicted in the decades ago, but are in fact uh, very sophisticated uh, uh, humans uh, along with us that in fact have contributed probably not only culture but also many genes to our uh, current genomes. So extraordinary really. Uh, Here's some of the technology that Neanderthals developed, uh, uh, the, uh, some of which, as we'll see in a moment, continues till today. They had throwing spears up to 400,000 years ago. Um, the oldest spear point uh, is 450,000 years old. It's made of English yew, and you all may know this uh, common uh, ornamental plant uh, here in uh, the United States. But the significance of that I'll show in a moment. Uh, the Neanderthals also um, shaped from old spruce. Uh, they knew to uh, carve it from a particular part of the tree using the roots, uh, which is the hardest wood for the spear point, and they knew to harden it with fire to make it even more capable of being uh, resistant as it pierced into an animal. Um, the significance of you, it was also known not just to the Neanderthals, but to Utsi, the, uh, the uh, wanderer who was found murdered uh, in the Italian Alps. Uh, he died 5, 000, over 5,000 years ago. And with uh, some of his clothing intact and uh, some of the, uh, some cordage and uh, medicinal fungi, and, uh, and significantly for us, also a bow, a bow also made of the same material, you. Now, yew wood is known to every, uh, every, every archer as the very best wood to make a bow from because it stores energy as if fiberglass, as if it were fiberglass. You can bend it and it stores the energy, the kinetic energy that then's released upon uh, releasing of the arrow. So it's really an, an optimal uh, material and it's been used by humans for 400,000 years, remarkable. So a little bit of culture uh, that has continued on along with performance art uh, in, 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 in closed settings that are resonant uh, and decorated. Here's uh, the archers, uh, the, bow, uh, the, uh, the bows found uh, sunken in the, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the Mary Rose that was Henry VIII's ship sunk in the, in the medieval times. Again, a continuity of views. And in fact, if you look for a U bow today, you'll find they're, they're among the most expensive and finest uh, produced for the same, very same qualities. Now let's, let's, let's uh, now turn a page over to other aspects of culture that are old and have continued till today. Uh, I think um, many of you may know what an atlatl is. That's a spear thrower. Uh, so basically, uh, you can get a lot more accuracy and much more momentum from a spear if you throw it not directly with your hand, but rather you make a little hook out of a stick with a little hook in it, and then you put the, the spear uh, end in that hook 
and then it gives you a, a greater, it basically lengthens your arm in effect. So it increases the speed uh, as well as the, you know, the, uh, the accuracy of the thrown spear. Now a spear thrower, you can make in about 10 minutes, right? It's just a stick with a, with a little crook in it. But this, the artist who uh, made this particular spear thrower found in Europe, and this is one of a number that have been found like this, took the time, probably you know, 10, 20 hours, to carve this uh, depiction of a young ibex. An ibex that's um, you know, sort of kneeling down and it's sort of paint with its head turned, it's looking up at its tail and underneath its tail, there's a big wad of excrement that's emerging. And there's a couple of woodpeckers perched on the top of it. Well, uh, that's extraordinary. So that clearly had some meaning. Now, whether it was humorous, uh, as you might think today, is would be an open question. Were it not for a discovery I made about 10 years ago uh, in an art store, I found this book uh, on art that was um, advertising this imminent uh, showing of this fellow Robert Williams, who I also invite you to look up. Uh, he's an interesting character characterizes himself as producing lowbrow art, which I thought was interesting. But at any rate, he produced this piece, which um, looks to all the world like the very same image. It's again a, a goat, uh, which is a, you know, ibexes are related to. Again, uh, sort of kneeling down, looking back up at its uh, hindquarters and there under its tail is emerging a diamond. And so this is uh, Robert Williams' uh, use of that very same image, I think, uh, for to depict uh, this notion of pretension. Now, I was so sh shocked to see the similarity of these images because I knew about the other one that I uh, took all of my skills as a writer and wrote a very deferential uh, letter to um, Robert Williams asking where, please, uh, uh, dear sir, you had um, gotten your inspiration for this image. Um, you know, it's really quite striking and effective. Uh, uh, and of course, I never heard back. Um, but. I don't think it really matters what the answer is. Either he saw it in an early art history book or, or he came to it independently. The point is, is that the same image strikes us as humorous today. That is, this is a 14,000 year old or 16,000 year old continuity of an idea that, seem, that strikes the human mind as humorous. I think that's extraordinary. It, uh, re it puts a little bit of, uh, of humanity on our conception of early humans. So that introduces the question then, where did modern awareness and sensibilities really come from? Uh, and so we can look at other aspects as well. You might be thinking, well, do other animals have a sense of humor? Well, um, humans aren't the only species with a sense of humor. Uh, other animals do as well. And we don't, it's another lecture to talk about, uh, you know, what chimpanzees will laugh at and, and other species too. Uh, it's really quite an extraordinary subject. Uh, it depends somewhat on how you define humor of course. Um, but humor, of course, also depends on awareness, awareness of yourself and awareness of how things will be received by others. So a theory of mind, in other words. So let's look at that more fundamental question first. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, about 50 years ago, a researcher realized that, you know, you could test whether or not an animal was self-aware by, present, by presenting it with a mirror and first mark, making a mark on its forehead that it could not know that uh, was there unless they could see it in a mirror and recognize that it's them that they're seeing and then they would clean it, right? So you anesthetize or otherwise uh, distract the animal. So you put, place this dot and then you present it with a mirror. And if the animal tries to scrape it off, you know that it recognizes itself in the mirror. Well, it turns out that uh, chimpanzees pass this test very readily and at a very early age, as do human beings, of course. You'd think then that, well, maybe gorillas would too. But if you put a big mirror out into the uh, forest where the gorillas are, they don't look at it long enough in order to test whether or not they recognize themselves. And the reason is kind of obvious in retrospect. It turns out that for a gorilla, looking at another gorilla in the eye is a threatening gesture. So they don't look long enough to see whether or not it's them. But in captivity, it turns out that they will look and they will recognize themselves. Uh, so gorillas pass the test and so do elephants, so do dolphins, 
orcas apparently do too, and even birds. Uh, so magpies pass the mirror test as well. So there's a little yellow spot you can see under the bill of the magpie, and they don't even have a neocortex. Now, some have objected that, well, you know, vision isn't the only way in which animals identify or self-identify. In fact, they most often, many animals, especially nocturnal ones, use uh, their sense of smell. Uh, or sense of hearing. And so we should extend this test, if we can think of it, to these other dimensions, uh, which I think is awaiting for some graduate student to, to pursue. Now that uh, then, of course, also gets to the idea of the theory of mind. Uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce now a, uh, a, the results of a paper that just came out uh, about four years ago, uh, a little less than um, in science. And uh, it is really an ingenious set of experiments that probes the minds of chimpanzees. So I'm gonna walk you through this experiment because it's worth taking the time. So what this is, is basically, these are just four vignettes of a video that was made for chimpanzees to watch. So we make the video and then we track what the chimpanzees are looking at in the video with lasers. And you can tell with these red dots where their focus is at any one moment. So that's the setup. We're gonna make this video. We've got two researchers, one in a green shirt uh, and another inside of a chimpanzee outfit. Now, the reason we do that is because the chimps will watch this one because you know they recognize, they think there's something pretty strange about that chimpanzee. So it gets their attention. So what we do is that we set, set this up so that there's the chimpanzee, the fellow in the chimpanzee suit is inside the cage, right? And uh, the fellow on the outside is watching. Now, the fellow on the outside has a rock. And he comes close enough to the cage that the, the fellow on the inside, the ape on the inside, can reach through the bars and grab the rock from him. He steals the rock. So he then uh, takes the rock and he places it under a, under a box here. Um, and the fellow on the outside in the green shirt very obviously sees the, the ape place this rock underneath the box. Now, now the, uh, what happens next is this fellow in the green shirt leaves the room. So the ape is now left alone in the cage. And so what he does is he takes, lifts up the first box, takes the rock out from that box and moves it to the second box. Now the researcher in the green shirt's not in the room, so he didn't see this happen. So now what happens is that this guy in the chimp suit, he leaves the, uh, the cage and the fellow in the uh, green shirt comes back. And so the question is, which box is the rock under? Now this fellow, um, as far as the chimpanzees watching the video uh, know, they, th they think that, they may think that he, know, that he believes it's under the first box because they know that he didn't see the, the ape move it from box one to box two. And sure enough, the chimpanzees watch box one because they, think, they know that he thinks that's where it is. So the idea is that they know what he's thinking and they know that he's wrong. Extraordinary. So they have a theory of mind. They can imagine the minds of another individual. And so that was the significance of this test. It's been redone several times since and with the same result. Uh, so it's really extraordinary because it's the first simple, uh, very elegant experiment that shows that, that apes have a theory of mind. So where did this kind of awareness and sensibilities, awareness of the minds of others come from and how far back does it go? Now we know that chimpanzees are, are our closest relatives on the planet today. Well, it turns out that uh, some degree of consciousness is present in most of the other vertebrates that have been tested. So uh, if you take Siamese fighting fish, at two males, and you put them in a, in a small confined place, they'll, they'll fight it out. They'll duke it out until one wins and the other's a loser. Then you, you separate the, the winner and the loser, and you present them with a choice of females to court. They could court a naive female that didn't see the battle, or they could court a female that did see them fight. Uh, so it turns out that the winner will court both females equally, uh, you know, enthusiastically, but the loser male prefers to court the female that didn't see him lose. So the loser female has an idea that the females that would see him lose would, you know, probably put him at a disadvantage. It has an idea of the oppression of the mind, if you will, of these, of these other fish, of the females that watch the, uh, the battle. It's extraordinary. Cleaner wrasses are other fish that are common in the Caribbean and other coral reefs around the world. They, uh, along with some shrimp, perform cleaning functions for reef fish. They'll perch themselves at the edge of coral and the reef fish will line up 
uh, in turn, and they'll be cleaned of uh, these uh, sea lice and other parasites that the wrasses pick off and, and enjoy, just as uh, birds clean the mouths of crocodiles you know, and other animals and hippos and other animals in Africa. It's the very same function. So it turns out that once in a while, the wrasses, if they don't find enough parasites, they'll take a little bite of the fish itself. Um, but they don't do that if there are other fish in line because the other fish in line will see that and then they'll leave the line. And the, so the, the fish remember the cheaters and the wrasses know this. And so they behave uh, differently depending on whether there are witnesses. Extraordinary. Now, a lot of this, of course, material is covered very much more expertly than I can cover it in, uh, in a series of books that have come out over the past few years by Peter Godfrey Smith. Uh, read about octopi minds. They are extraordinary. In fact, they have separate minds, one in each of those eight tentacles. Uh, re read What Else a Fish Knows uh, by Jonathan Balcom. Or you could read, uh, you know, this, the most recent extraordinary expert, of course, is Franz De Waal, and I'll refer to him again. Uh, are, and he asked this question, are we smart enough to know how smart animals are? That's a great question. I mean, we can think of tests that we can think of, right, with our own two hands and the like, and that we could imagine passing. Uh, but is that the right frame of reference or the only one for an animal that doesn't have hands or that doesn't live in a terrestrial world, but rather an aquatic one uh, or an aerial one? So it's a, it's a challenge for us uh, to bridge that gap. Don Griffin, I mentioned he was an early theorist, uh, uh, you know, a biologist who was trained at Harvard, an undergraduate. In fact, uh, he was a class of 38, and his uh, senior thesis was uh, basically discovering that bats have echolocation. Uh, he was the fellow who discovered it. He was a naturalist, knew about uh, their special abilities somehow that they could see in the dark, and he brought it to one of our physicists, G.W. Pierce, uh, who was an uh, associate of Leverett House, in fact, at the time. Uh, and uh, he, uh, they tested uh, the abilities of bats. Uh, in fact, they found they had used ultrasound that had never been discovered before and it opened up a whole new field, of course. Uh, this was, uh, of course, a very long time ago. And, but Donald Griffith, back in the 60s and 70s, said, you know, there's this topic of, uh, of consciousness uh, in, in other animal species um, that should be explored. So he was a pioneer. Other wonderful books on animal emotions by my former colleague, Mark Beckoff, University of Colorado, and Carl Safina, Beyond Words, I'd recommend. recommend. Now, I know you're, you're all thinking, you're, I'm sure you're, you're probably accepting the idea that there are degrees of consciousness among other species and, and uh, probably degrees of culture as well. But I know what you're thinking. Do they do art? Well, uh, that's also something that's been looked at. So, on the top are bower birds from New Guinea that uh, build these extraordinary constructions. On the, low, uh, on, the, on the lower part of the screen are similar constructions um, constructed by, by humans, uh, these particular artists in, in Great Britain. Well, the bower birds are very fastidious in their presentations, and these are males uh, wanting to convince females to mate with them. And so if you were to disturb this male and you go in and you move a couple of bottle caps around and then you leave, they will come back and they'll put them exactly where they were. So they have a very definite idea on the curation of these presentations, these displays uh, for um, their audience, uh, which is particular females will come through one at a time, check it out at very great length, and you can watch in David Attenborough's spe special and, and, and get the details if you'd like, or on YouTube, but they are extraordinary. Uh, is it art? Don't know. Uh, it's at least aesthetic, it seems. So in fact, uh, about uh, uh, seven or eight years ago, this uh, new sort of initiative uh, field started to develop on the, a scientific approach to art and aesthetic experience. There is a, a new uh, journal that was uh, what was born then, the Psychology of Aesthetics, Creativity in the Arts, uh, and the scientists at MIT and elsewhere have run, been running down this path. So here's a, the one of the inaugural issue on uh, neuroaesthetics, the cognition and neurobiology of aesthetic experience. Uh, on the science of beauty. And we have uh, some of our esteemed uh, Harvard lecturers uh, with wonderful courses on this very uh, topic showing exactly which parts of the brains light up when you show particular art objects to, the, to, to an audience, uh, the emerging field of neuroaesthetics. But there's been some pushback as well uh, from the art side. Uh, uh, so the, uh, these art theorists, um, the Stephen Brown and uh, Ellen DeSanayaki have pointed out that, you know, the arts are more than aesthetics. Uh, really, uh, neuroaesthetics is just mentioning one dimension of this. Um, and of course, uh, there's an there's a opinion piece here in Nature making the very same point. Uh, basically, uh, 
that is, uh, and the way I capture their point is this way, that art is not an object. It's not, uh, 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 it's not particular things. It's, it is a process. So art is a verb. Uh, and neuro, their point is that neuroesthetics cannot distinguish art from non-art. So I could draw a one-eyed camel too, but it wouldn't have nearly the meaning and significance of that drawn by Picasso. Uh, you know, we just can't tell the human brain which carries a meaning and which, which is not. Uh, it's not about features. Arts represent a broader range of human experience than the concern or preferences for particular features. It's as much or more about the artist than it is about the audience. Uh, so why do we artify? Well, art is about meaning. And it's, uh, meaning is about making connections. It's about memory. And, and it's about connecting two things. So memories, are, I think, are the, then the, the bricks that cultures are made of. They're passed down and, uh, they, from one generation to another. Uh, and it's all about remembering the significance of things. So this is uh, a recent, uh, one of the most recent books by Ed Wilson uh, on the origins of creativity that explores this through the humanities uh, and the sciences uh, at much greater length than I have time for here. So what is the importance of connection and meaning to us? Well, uh, this is another one of these uh, moments uh, in the readings that I've done uh, over the past uh, you know, 10, 20 years on this all on this, across this array of topics, uh, related topics, uh, that really struck me. Uh, again, like another ton of bricks, uh, just like the resonant cave uh, rooms did. So this uh, was a, this study, this is basically a review of studies which um, address the old, somewhat older observation that people in hospitals who have, uh, you know, in dire circumstances, um, but who are visited by family and friends do much better than those who are socially isolated. Uh, so we've known this for quite a long time, that it's good to have family and friends visiting you in hospitals uh, if you can. So what these researchers have done is they've go gone on to, into hospitals and they've issued questionnaires to, to, to patients uh, that are you know, in, uh, in tough situations about the re their visitations, family and friends and the like. And then they took blood samples from them. They uh, then um, sequenced uh, the, uh, the DNA of those uh, blood samples, and what they found was rather extraordinary. They found a, a stark dichotomy between the socially isolated patients and the patients that were visited often by family and friends. They, they measured over the gene expression of over 200 genes, I think 209 different genes having to do with our immune system. Uh, so the, uh, these are, they classified as mostly as good genes that improve our, our immune response, and then bad genes, which actually boost the inflammation response, which of course is what often actually ends up killing us. Uh, it turns out that in lonely people, the, uh, the good genes are, are down-regulated, so they're, uh, they're colored in green here, and the bad genes are up-regulated. While in the socially integrated, it's the reverse. The good genes are upregulated, uh, so they're colored in red, they're highly expressed, and the bad genes, the inflammation genes, are downregulated. So that is a measurable impact of social connection on health. And that struck me so strongly, both because of the immediate context of the importance of our connection to each other uh, in, you know, in all sorts of uh, um, contexts, not just hospitals, I think. Uh, and I don't think it's just social connection either. Uh, so as you'll see in a moment, um, I've been thinking a little bit more broadly about it. Uh, but uh, let me uh, look, show you first uh, a more recent uh, review, which came out just a year or two ago by some of these same authors, focusing on the uh, negative impacts of, uh, you know, of the outside world, including the lack of social interaction on, on human beings. This is their model of how these, uh, this, our social uh, environment uh, might impinge on them through our uh, through the hormone systems, the endocrine systems, and the sympathetic nervous system on various receptors that then are, are then influence DNA transcription. This is a well-known process, the, the details in here, and then they influence our health and behavior. And so they were just pointing uh, out that it's not just a lack of visitation and loneliness, but it could have been past threats or, or anger or whatever it is. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, even discrimination, of course, has a strong impact on us, we, we know, and even hearing about discrimination has an, a measurable impact on our immune systems. So if you add in the positive influences to this, uh, this model here, you would find, you know, this would be a full picture then. 
So, in our, so our immune systems really are the result of a million years battling infections and being connected to each other and to, as we'll see in a moment, to our to the outside world. Uh, so that's uh, the the this is my COVID one COVID slide, uh, and so the point that I like to emphasize here is one that I heard from a physician on on the television uh, a few weeks ago now, and it's that we're not socially dis distancing ourselves, we're physically distancing ourselves, we're socially connected, and that's the important piece, you remain connected to each other, because our immune systems depend on it, uh, so everybody wins on, in that. So, you know, uh, when I gave a version of this lecture a few years ago, um, my son was in high school, and he brought in uh, an example that they were discussing in class about this observation that U.S. presidents live longer than we think that they should, given the pressures of the office. So that was, and the question is why? So it turns out that uh, there's been a fair bit of analysis of this and uh, they uh, apparently uh, live longer. It's true that US presidents live longer than, than you might think that they would, given the pressure. Uh, and it might have something to do with their social status. Uh, it's probably also access to resources uh, as well. But it's an interesting question and it, opens this question, makes it a little bit more broadly about what's the more broad, what's the connection between social status, social connection, and health? Well, uh, back in the early 50s, a, a, a seminal paper came out, uh, really started a discipline. Uh, it was uh, a a, basically a study of Japanese macaques whose social behaviors have been studied for a very long time. And the observation, the casual observation was made that, you know, we've been um, throwing sweet potatoes to these macaques on the beaches of Japan for, for some time and seeing how they, you know, how they uh, share them, fight over them, uh, and uh, otherwise uh, to mediate their social interactions through consumption of this good that we're, we're providing. But it was noticed by one researcher that this young female macaque carried the sweet potatoes, the sandy sweet potato pieces on the beach into the water and threw them in. And of course, the sand was washed off, sunk to the bottom, and the sweet potato floated. She could then enjoy a sand-free meal. That was ex an extraordinary insight on her part. Well, it turns out that the other young Japanese macaques learned this behavior very quickly, but none of the older macaques would imitate her because of her subordinate social status, apparently. Though it took a generation or two before all of the macaques ended up washing their sweet potatoes. An interesting observation on the, social st the importance of social status uh, to, uh, you know, to, this, uh, to their, the social connections between these macaques. Well, it turns out that just uh, this last uh, few years ago, uh, the, uh, this general question of social status in macaques has been, uh, put to the experimental test. And so this is, uh, was again, a, a sort of a brilliant uh, experimental design where we take these uh, Japanese macaque troops and you introduce, uh, these actually are rhesus macaques, come to think of it. You introduce um, young females uh, who are new to the troops, they're, they're strangers. You introduce them one at a time. You take pairs of young females that are naive to the troops and, uh, and you introduce them one at a time to these, these macaque troops and they're accepted. Uh, well, it turns out that uh, if you do that a, n a number of different times so that you can control for other things like, you know, their overall health and genetics and the like, but you do that, introduce one and then the other female, the fem their females are otherwise identical. The first one who's introduced is given a higher social status by the troop than the second one introduced. You take blood samples from those, uh, those two females a number of times across the replicates of this experiment, and it turns out that there is a striking effect on the immune system. The ones with a higher social status have their immune systems boosted for uh, those factors which manage infections. While those that are lower social status, they have actually a bacterial response which is boosted because they're treated more poorly and they have poor quality food and the like. So social status mediates the immune system uh, of these, of these, uh, these uh, rhesus macaques, which is quite extraordinary, really. So it's uh, been generalized into what might be the biology of inequality across other species as well possibly our own. And once again, I'll mention that even inequality itself, of course, means with fewer resources, but it also the perception of status and uh, this uh, discrimination has its effects not only on the individuals, but on other individuals who are aware of them. So that's the perniciousness of uh, inequality. So um, 
this is uh, quite remarkable. Uh, what we thought was unmeasurable, the effect of social status on, on, on each other, uh, it turns out to be quite measurable. And so that struck me uh, all the more because as a biologist, I'd been thinking about our relationships to nature as well as to other humans. And I thought uh, I was becoming aware of this influence of nature on health through some of these very same mechanisms. So it occurred to me that maybe it isn't just our responses to other primates uh, or other, that is, or other humans in our case, but responses to nature as well. So there's, a, I've been introduced to this idea of Shinrin Yoku by a, a School of Public Health employee, uh, Julia Africa, a former employee, uh, a few years back. And I started uh, reading this literature, which uh, really started in Japan, now is uh, extended through the Scandinavian countries and now the United States, including the Harvard Medical School, our own School of Public Health. It's this phenomenon called Shinrin-yoku. Shinrin-yoku is a, a term coined by the Japanese Ministry of Forest, uh, Fisheries, and Agriculture back in the early 1980s. And it captures, it's a phrase that means forest bathing. And it captures the idea traditional in J Japan, that uh, spending time in nature is good for your health. It turns out, of course, that's a time-honored practice there and in many other cultures as well. So they captured that idea with this phrase and they um, put it upon the ministries uh, and the prefectures across Japan to implement uh, this kind of training in nature experiences. Uh, and that was, it, been, it took off like a rocket uh, through Japan. It turns out that even many of their large corporations enforce this and what required as part of their wellness programs. And you know what, as a result, their insurance costs go down. So everyone wins once again. So this, uh, it turns out that there are a number of, number of researchers have um, investigated the immunological basis of uh, these nature experiences, as well as the base, the uh, impact on our, uh, you know, on our, um, on brain waves and on our heart rates and our stress hormone levels, cortisol and the rest. There isn't the kind of uh, research funds available for this kind of work that there is, for example, that UCLA, UCLA finds in the hospitals uh, with uh, patients uh, you know, um, in intensive care and the like. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the research is very promising. And uh, it shows from the observational, you know, the uh, inverse relationship between cancer and, uh, and, and, and parks in uh, the prefectures in Japan to the impacts on, um, you know, stress on uh, measured in a number of different ways. These are just a handful of the smattering of the, of the really burgeoning literature on this topic. And I'll show you a review uh, book that just came out from Oxford University Press uh, in another slide or two. Uh, so, uh, some of these researchers, um, uh, led by Kring Lee uh, in Japan at the University of, of, of Tokyo, have uh, demonstrated uh, the effect on anti-cancer proteins. Uh, and uh, here at the School of Public Health and the Harvard Medical School, also on uh, rumination and depression. We know that this is used for PTSD. It's used for uh, veterans. Uh, it's really quite an extraordinary influence, the effect of nature on health. Uh, Julia's written a wonderful review uh, that we can consider, in fact, this another ecosystem service, another service of our national parks. And I think this is extraordinary because what this means is that there's a public health value of national parks. And that, I think, is a game changer. As we'll see in a moment, I think education plays a role in that as well. This is the book I mentioned, the Oxford Textbook of Nature and Public Health, an extraordinary compilation of studies uh, of all of the effects of nature experiences on our overall health in all of these different ways. So basically it's of a piece uh, with the impact on our health of our social connectivity. And nature of course is more than a resource, it's our home. So maintaining this global health uh, clinic is really uh, the, uh, the charge that Ed Wilson has taken on uh, with his Half Earth uh, uh, presentation, um, which came out a couple of years ago. And what we know is that uh, I can say as an ecologist that experimental uh, studies show that the more diverse a, a, a ecological community is, the healthier it is, the more productive it is. You can add water, you can add fertilizer, or you can add more species. And adding more species does more than the other factors, which are kind of obvious, uh, does much more in producing the overall productivity. It's because every species in a forest or in a field has a slightly different niche. It fills a slightly different role. And so altogether, the community is stronger and more productive. I think there's an analogy with human uh, communities as well. I'll leave that to you. 
So there's a fair uh, literature on this topic. Uh, the Nature Fix, of course, is one. Uh, there are wonderful uh, reviews, of course, in the New York Times. And I'll make this a, a parallel with the microbiome, which we now know governs much of our health. We know that uh, those little one-celled masters we have in our guts uh, lead us to snack between meals, lead us towards the carbohydrates that we'd rather not do with. And in fact, that's good news because it means, number one, that uh, if you use your force of will to refrain from those kind, that kind of diet that's not good for your health, in fact, you'll diminish the competitive edge that those carbohydrate-loving uh, uh, microbes um, have over you, and you'll favor the other kinds of microbes, which will then uh, dominate uh, and make it easier for you to uh, stick to your diet. So I think, though, that the microbiome is met by the macrobiome in uh, its influence on our health. I think this is true for young children. Uh, it's true for adults. And this has been written about, of course, many times. I, I think personally, just as an evolutionary biologist and as a now grown up uh, boy naturalist, um, I uh, think that it's really the regularity of nature that is reinforcing of our emotional and neurological selves, our development through childhood. When you see the seasons change in a regular way, one year to the next, uh, you recognize things that are old friends from years past, whether it's the timing of uh, flowering or the songs that you're hearing or the turning of colors in the fall or the smells and the, the, the sights and the sounds all, uh, I think, reinforce the, the sense that they're all is right with the world, that the world's comprehensible and it's understandable. And I think that's in contrast to the rather cha chaotic uh, uh, morass that, we're that we encounter in cities. So as important as the vet connections with other humans are, I think that's part of the equation only. So this is where I think our universities and our high schools and our elementary schools come in. I think that while we all get a lift from going to the forest, maybe if we know what we're hearing and seeing or smelling, we get a bigger lift from it. So maybe education has a public health value. For me, that is also a game changer, that idea that the more you know, the better off you are. And I think it's probably not just true of going to the forest or connections with other people. It's probably true of everything that drives our joys. You know, it might be the arts as well, dance, music, all of it. And the earlier we start, the better. So I would invite you to read The Last Child in the Woods uh, came out, this extraordinary volume, uh, quite timely and quite prescient uh, uh, 10 years ago or more. Uh, we know even of the value of biophilia, the economist can tell you why it makes sense to, to, to design biophilic buildings or to uh, design even communities so that there's trees around. We even know the value of a tree on the lot of a house that's for sale, right? It adds a measurable value. So we recognize this all the way around. Why don't we recognize it now? Uh, take advantage of that relationship in our schools. But what if it isn't just people in forests, but everything we experience, as I mentioned. Uh, we've known that music and art have long been recognized as important to health. There is art therapy and music therapy as well. Uh, and we know that experience is crucial to learning. Experiential learning, of course, is all the rage now. But you know what? William James thought of it 100 years ago. Uh, James and, uh, uh, and his uh, follower uh, uh, and friend, uh, John Dewey, um, both argued that the that experience is is more important uh, as or as important as reading. Uh, so direct experience is important, and it probably also uh, incidentally boosts your health uh, through the immune system. This was the first James, William James lecture. Uh, this is a book resulting from it, Art as Experience, back in '32. James thought of a lot of this. Boy, I'd invite you to read these uh, early volumes from him. Uh, he was, uh, of course, I'll. I'll toot the horn of the MCZ. He was an MCZ student of Agassiz back in the uh, late eight, 1800s, uh, was a zoologist first, and then decided that uh, humans were as interesting an animal as any other. And so he basically developed the field of psychology in two massive classic volumes, uh, and then went on to uh, contemplate religion and, and spiritual matters as well, as we'll see. And this is where uh, I've come to the idea that uh, what physicists uh, have known for a hundred years, what philosophers have known for a thousand, biologists can now confirm. Everything we touch touches us back. There's, a, there's an interaction, there's a, there's a process, uh, a connection. So that's a profound observation, I think. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'm reminded of um, Jack, Jackson Pollock, uh, who uh, was a, of course, in the vanguard of, um, 
of, of contemporary artists, modern artists in, in Manhattan back during the 1940s. Uh, and then he left all of that behind and fled to the, uh, the, you know, the, the remote woods of, uh, of Long Island. Uh, and someone asked him why, whether he, and of course his work took on a very different, radically different character, as you can see here. Uh, someone asked him, an interviewer, why he made the move. Does he now work from nature? And of course, he famously answered, I am nature. Well, we are nature, uh, all of us, uh, and that's the point. Uh, this is a, a, a painting uh, that I chose to use as the cover of that Revista issue four years ago. It's from my sister-in-law, Monica Ferreras, uh, a Dominican contemporary artist, um, with whom I've been in a conversation uh, for 30 years now uh, about the relationship between arts and sciences. Um, and I think that we found a, quite a lot of common ground, actually. Uh, it's been uh, uh, of great mutual benefit. Uh, I was astonished, nevertheless, a couple of years ago when she announced the title of her latest uh, exhibit, uh, which was going on display. Uh, she titled it, You Never Know. That struck me because, as a scientist, that's the same thing. That's our position, basically. You never know. You never know anything for sure. Uh, so we call ourselves, ironically, I think, homo sapiens, the man who knows. But if there's anything that the disciplines of the world agree on, is that we don't know anything, really. So Cowper said it, put it well, God moves in a mysterious way. Feynman also said, of course, scientific knowledge is just a degree of certainty, very, of varying amounts. Uh, nothing is absolutely certain. You have to be comfortable with that. Uh, many things are ambiguous. And Picasso, of course, famously said that art was a lie that reveals the truth. Well, so if the great disciplines of the world, the, 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 you know, religion, uh, the uh, social sciences, the sciences, the arts, uh, agree on one thing, then maybe um, we can also agree that we're actually not homo sapiens, but homo explicans. We're the explaining person, the explaining humans, the humans that choose to explain the world around us because, in fact, after all, it's more adaptive than not explaining. It's much more adaptive to think that, well, maybe that bent grass in the meadow in front of me was made by a lion passing through there than to ignore it, right? Better to over-explain than to under-explain the world. We're always making connections of all sorts. And some of them end up being uh, correct. And so that is adaptive. It's adaptive to perceive those connections. Nature produces them and often enough we're right and that helps. So, um, you know, I, I can't help but stop and pause with this, you know, uh, phrase from William James from the varieties of re religious experience and think that, you know, uh, his analogy was we may be in the world, in the universe as dogs and cats are in our library, seeing the books and hearing the conversation, but having no inkling of the meaning of it all. So in other words, you know, we can measure just the things we've thought of measuring, right? Uh, we can measure things that are unseen. We can measure neutrinos passing through us every moment. Uh, you know, we can measure other forms of electromagnetic radiation. Uh, you know, we can measure our connections to each other, but there's much more than that that we haven't thought of measuring. So, you know, who are we to say that uh, all there is is um, what we can measure? So this was a, a position that uh, William James characterized uh, and derided as scientism. It's a position that everything of importance can be explained by the methods of science. And of course, there is a, another extreme position, that of a, a mysticism, which is the position that nothing of importance can be explained by the methods of science. Uh, of course, the truth is somewhere in between. It's the pragmatism of William James that, you know, uh, maybe um, we should uh, sort of try and see what we can explain by our methods uh, and by various kinds of methods and whatever works, uh, you know, that's the criterion, basically. We're in, a, a, uh, we're in the mode of trying to improve our virtual reality model of the universe around us, the universe of humanity and the universe of everything outside of humanity, the rest of the, the, rest of the world and beyond. Uh, so it's basically a, a virtual reality model that, we're, that we improve by successive iter iterations, and we know we're getting someplace when it allows further explanation and further predictions that seem correct. We learn by consensus, basically. So that's the common ground between uh, science and mysticism. It's acceptance of not knowing, yet acting as if we do. That's the power of belief and conviction. So 
James said that science, but not scientism, is a disposition. You accept uncertainty and you make a choice nevertheless. You don't fold your arms and say, well, I'm not going to decide about this thing until all the evidence is in. That doesn't get you anywhere very quickly. Uh, it's much more useful, more useful to have a compass than it is an actual, than wait for an actual map. To have a direction, you'll learn, progress more quickly. To make a bold hypothesis, it's much more easily tested than a weak hypothesis that's kind of, you know, mealy mouth. Well, maybe it's this way and maybe it's not. Uh, you know, make a claim and you're more readily, more quickly shown wrong than you can figure out the new direction to go in than not. Uh, that uh, analogy actually came out of a conversation with a with an undergraduate about ten years ago. Uh, so I've realized, as uh, as James did, what the power of belief actually is, uh, and the power of belief is it provides this inner compass for us to navigate an uncertain world, and uh, as if we knew what we were doing, and that's helpful. Uh, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, it also explains, as we'll see in a moment, some very well-known effects, uh, the placebo effect uh, in, in particular. Now, I'll mention quickly that I've seen uh, the art, the work of another Dominican artist, Jorge Pineda, which uh, was t which t is entitled placebos, in fact, which is the Greek meaning I shall please, placer, the Spanish version, uh, and please, of course, is the same root. Uh, it's, and this was, of course, his uh, take on uh, when reality is actually art. So the placebo response is um, a nuisance variable for res medical researchers, but it's good news for the rest of us. So in fact, uh, it, what it means is that all of the, the trappings of the bedside manner, you know, the words, the ritual, uh, can really change the patient's brain, and as we've seen, therefore the stress levels, and therefore the immune system and the response and strengthen our health. Believing in the cure m makes a difference. So imagine you were 500 years ago, uh, you have an illness, you don't know what it is. You could come to a shaman like this one. You could enter into his tent with all kinds of smoke and chant and ritual for 24 hours where at the end he reaches deep inside your body and pulls out the evil spirit all at once and you're cured. You feel better. Or you could go to a medieval physician and he'll drain some blood and inject you with some poisons or whatever else he does. Which would you choose? In fact, I think you'd be better off with the shaman because this, this the power of belief is something that he knows to, to, uh, to, mu to muster in your behalf. He's a broker with the other worlds in a way. So this is an evolutionary model from Beatrice, the biologist, uh, that suggests how this could really spread through humanity. Uh, so you could choose to believe uh, or not believe that this magic crystal has, he has healed you. If, you. if you don't believe it, then you might then leave a rather pessimistic uh, future. But if you do believe it, um, you might have uh, some kind of an evolutionary advantage. Uh, and in fact, approach uh, life as a, in a more optimistic way. So that's, that's the simple uh, idea of how the placebo effect could spread through early humans. So with this, of course, has been well, well researched. Uh, we know about the role of conditioning and verbal suggestion in both placebo and nocebo effects on itch. Uh, so it's an experiment where you can basically by you can convince a patient that they either don't have itch any itch at all or that they have an extreme itch that won't go away uh, you can convince them with words uh, and the nocebo effect has a negative uh, effect on your health and once again this is like discrimination hearing about discrimination in others or hearing about bad situations nocebo means i will harm so this then takes us to uh, sort of the, the last chapter of this um, you know, uh, my favorite, uh, maybe yours too, uh, you know, God Stand In Impersonator. This is Morgan Freeman, uh, a wonderful series, uh, again, on PBS, uh, National Geographic Channel, uh, on the story of what we believe and why. Um, who out in the audience uh, appreciates contemporary art? I'm sure many of you do. Well, these uh, are not so contemporary. These are actually 7,000 years old, they were found in Romania, and they're well known. Uh, in fact, um, the, uh, they, are also, they also uh, are named according to uh, now, uh, unfortunately, well-established bias. Uh, the one on the left is the male, the one on the right is the female. The one on the left is called the thinker. Uh, he's obviously at least uh, lost deep in thought, um, maybe contemplating the meaning of life or some such. And the female, his companion on the side, uh, 
is who's unnamed is actually uh, resting patiently with her hands on her knee, uh, probably waiting for him to arrive at the obvious. Uh, so the obvious is this. Um, the obvious is that all religions and philosophies agree on the importance of three things. To be together, the value of sociability, to work towards a common good, that's actually very helpful for us as individuals, to work for others, and to appreciate what we have, gratitude. So sociability, striving, and gratitude are all key ingredients of every philosophy from the Dalai Lama to the Pope uh, and to the, uh, basically to the Druids and everyone else. Uh, it's uh, really quite a Judaism. Every religion you can think of agrees on the importance of being together, being grateful for what you have, and for working for something that's larger than yourself. And that's, that's a relationship and an importance that William James also recognized. It's something that the, the soldier and the musician, are, for example, share in common. They're working towards some larger good. It takes the pressure off of an individual to justify your existence. You're working for for a common cause. It's the social piece, uh, the, the sense of community that Homo sapiens evolved to be. So almost all human history was lived in small social groups. Individual selection uh, favored selfish acts, that of cheating, of uh, stealing, of adultery, of even of murder uh, that might benefit an individual in the short term. But then the group selection would favor acts that helped others. So those groups, so small social groups, which in, in which individuals who are more cooperative might actually have a long-term evolutionary advantage over those that were composed of selfish individuals. That's uh, Ed Wilson's idea that, uh, well, maybe those acts, selfish versus generous, uh, correspond to vice and virtue, and their dual origin explains the conflicted nature of our motivations. So when we're approached by someone on the street looking for money, we might uh, do an internal calculation. Do we give what we have in our pockets or do we not? Uh, it's that conflict between our individual needs uh, and, uh, the, and the group, the feeling of connectiveness to others, uh, which is an interesting, it's the first kind of evolutionary explanation of vice and virtue that I'd seen. Uh, but I take it a little further. I think actually that um, all of our pro-social behaviors are our virtues and really we are no more fully human than, we are, than when we love each other. That's, those are emotions and feelings that I have no doubt that other social animals feel as well. What better motivation to help another individual for whom it's in your advantage to help uh, as part of a group than to feel this emotional attachment? I think that's very helpful. And I, I think that we're no more fully human as social animals uh, for a million years now uh, than when we love others. So Wilson says, thinks also that, uh, you know, um, if you were to come from outer space, uh, folks come from Mars, Mars attacks, they come down, they want to understand everything there is to know about planet Earth. Well, they could understand all of the biodiversity, all of the ecology and the evolution and everything else with existing technology, but not human culture. For that, they would have to interview us. So that, those are the particulars that stitch us together. Those are the, uh, the things that we've realized, the uh, generalizations, the observations, uh, some of the conjectures, the relationships that the humanities and the social sciences and the sciences combined produce, uh, hum to produce human culture. So what Wilson points out uh, is that uh, the humanities can give the sciences the unpredictable phenomena of human culture, and the sciences can also give the humanities stranger realms than are imaginable, the realms of quarks, of subatomic particles, of dark matter, for example, it would be wonderful the humanities could sketch out where we could go with these ideas. So I've started to make just a short list of uh, those kinds of concepts that are gifts from one side to the other. So from math, uh, independently originated by the Mayans and the, and the Arabs, uh, the concept of zero. For me, that's a fundamental concept because we're too often limited in our thinking by our observations. We imagine what we've seen. The concept of zero is a placeholder. It's it stands in for a category for which we don't have any observations yet. So it's a door to be opened. And so it's an important observation, I think, a important concept. In art and music, we have the idea of negative space. It's what complements and strengthens the, uh, the built space. We have the rest stop, which is what makes sense of the notes. 
we have in the con in law the concept of a reasonable person. What would a reasonable person conclude given our uh, the sense of the uh, the evidence at hand? And there might be different standards of evidence depending on the severity of the possible penalties. Uh, for in science, we have the, con the, the concept of the continuum, while in the humanities, they tend to, their emphasis tends to be on the quality of a thing. Uh, we also have the idea of infinity in both directions, uh, towards the infinitesimal as well as the universal. Uh, in biology, we have this fairly new concept of history trees, of phylogenies, genealogies, of branching contingent histories, which each step depends on the step before. In physics, we have the idea of quanta, which are counterintuitive in many ways, of action at a distance, uh, you know, uh, of these weak and strong forces, uh, really quite extraordinary. Psychology, the idea of archetypes in the subconscious and from religion, the notion of oneness with the universe. I uh, had a technician uh, from Poland in my lab uh, about 15 years ago who said that, you know, uh, in Polish, we don't have the word science. What we have is the word nauka, which doesn't mean science. What it means is learning. And so I thought maybe we should have a moratorium on the word science, at least in teaching, because, you know, science kind of conveys the idea that there is a subset of us who are trained, who wear white lab coats and have this arcane kind of uh, intricate, uh, sophisticated training to be able to conduct experiments and the like. And that's what scientists is and it's what scientists do, but it's not. Science is what we do every day. It's what we do to make a generalization from our observations of the world. When you meet someone new, you might think, well, all uh, right, I'm observing this person. I have an eye developing a sense of how they are. And this is how I, I describe this to our undergraduates who have met their classmates for the first time freshman year. They might have an idea of how that person they just met might behave in a future situation. So they're making a, a prediction, basically. They have an expectation. And if they're surprised by their behavior, they'll revise their idea of how that person was. That's science. It's just keeping an open mind making some observations, making a generalization and a prediction, taking further observations, and then either changing your mind or not uh, and continuing on. And that's all science is. It's what we do every day. So it's learning. Now, uh, one extraordinary learner uh, was, um, or is actually Temple Grandin. And I read first read her story back in the early 1990s when I was a uh, professor, a young assistant professor at the University of Colorado, and she was uh, nearby next door at Colorado State University. I read about her in The New Yorker where Oliver Sacks had just written a, uh, an essay entitled um, An Anthropologist on Mars. That phrase was Temple's own. It described, it was her answer to the question, well, let me describe Temple first to you. Temple was the daughter of a Radcliffe graduate in 1950, she was born in 1950, was uh, basically aphasic, didn't speak for four years until she was four years old. And her mother refused to institutionalize her, her, which was what was typically done with autistic children at that time. She said, no, I've done everything uh, that I'm supposed to do. It's not in our interaction. She has abilities. Uh, I'm going to put her in special schools. And she did. And in fact, later in high school, young Temple um, met a science professor who realized that she does have gifts in science. In fact, what she has an ability to do is to think in pictures. She has a photographic memory. So Temple um, used that photographic memory to imagine the, the things that other animals could see. So she was fascinated with animals and she was utterly captivated by um, by cows and by horses and other large domesticated animals. So she went on through her undergraduate years to do a master's degree and then a PhD at Arizona State University, where she studied animal husbandry. There, uh, there's a wonderful movie, in fact, an HBO film that I saw three or four times on a flight to China once uh, because it struck me so deeply. Uh, and I'll, I'll show you why, I'll tell you why. The, uh, the class was in a stockyard in Arizona and uh, the, the cattle below were mooing like crazy, as cattle do in stockyards. Temple was the one female in the class and she noticed that they were moving and commented to the professor in the class, you know, why are they moving? And of course he dismissed it. He said, uh, well, they, you know, that's what they do. So she uh, 
stuck with that and said, you know, they're unhappy. And so what she did was a master's thesis that she designed basically showed through experimental design and through her own physical designs that in fact, if you were to design these stockyards so that they eliminated all the things that make cattle nervous, uh, the uncertain footing, the flashing bits of metal, the, the excessive noise and the like, if you were to redesign it so they feel like they're in a, in a herd, just slowly moving towards their end, then in fact, you'd end up with lower handling costs, a lower lot of race, a uh, lot, lot uh, lower uh, rate of loss of, uh, of cattle, and uh, all of your costs would go down. And so in fact, that was published and it uh, made, it had a, was a landmark paper. Uh, remarkably, it changed the, uh, the cattle industry. Over half of the uh, meat products and cattle products in the United States uh, go through her designs now. She revolutionized the world, really. Uh, through more humane des uh, designs for managing cattle. Uh, extraordinary. Oh, um, ha ha why the anthropologist on Mars? So s someone asked her, I think it was Sachs, asked her how she could navigate uh, a uh, academic setting, given that she didn't really get the all of the body language, all the nuances of social connection that the rest of us uh, grow up sort of like understanding. And that is the, the glances, uh, you know, the, the movements, the subtleties of our interactions with each other. Um, she didn't, she doesn't see that. Uh, she's, uh, you know, basically uh, not able to, per to percept. Well, she said, you know, uh, I just pretended I'm an anthropologist on Mars and I'm just watching the denizens, the residents and learning what the rules are. You learn to make eye contact. You learn to shake a hand. Um, you know, you learn how to get along. And that's what she did. So at any rate, there's the uh, the book, of course, that Sachs uh, published. So that's a long ways uh, a long way around describing uh, what the idea that I want to introduce, and that is that um, there are many ways of thinking about the world uh, and approaching explanation of the world around us and the world inside us. Uh, and Temple has showed us that there is a different way of approaching the world that uh, takes you know advantage of our particular inclinations and gifts. So I've understood this to mean that, well, you know, uh, I think regardless of where we come from, this planet or another even, uh, we can probably agree that math is a, is a universe, something of a universal language and people have for many years, of course. Let me refresh my voice. Music, of course, is related to math, as everyone knows. Art. Music is one of the arts. Architecture, of course, is art made practical. And landscape architecture, architecture is architecture taken outdoors. The, uh, that, uh, of course, is meant to describe landscapes, which are composed of ecosystems, which follow ecological rules, which, are, which is a branch of biology, which is chemistry, largely, which, of course, is physics, which is math. And so there's a continuum of among the disciplines uh, between what we might call on the one hand, the arts, and on the other hand, the sciences. So these are a continuum of ways of representing the world with words and symbols and colors or notes or forms, whatever, whatever little stand-ins, whatever icons we use, whatever symbols we use to, rep to represent a more complex reality as we saw at the beginning of the program. Uh, these are take different flavors and different colors, if you will, but uh, they are stand-ins for that allow us to communicate with each other more effectively. We don't have to explain all of the theory and all of the meaning when we get this common language, uh, however it is. So I think actually that uh, the, from the arts and the sciences, we meet at some middle ground from the arts, the disciplines of language and literature and philosophy, uh, and from the sciences, those of psychology, sociology, and political science, center then in the middle on, on religion. Uh, and so this is, these are a, con a continuum, basically, of thought. We represent the worlds, and they might be, they might be, they might differ in formality. So, and I, you know, you might think, well, maybe that depends a bit on the consequences of being wrong. So it's probably much less dire if you're an artist than if you are a nuclear physicist. So you might design your experiments a little bit more carefully in the latter case uh, than the former, but it's degrees of formality really, not difference in kind. So I've thought, I've taken this perspective to ask to a question that I've, I've pondered for many years, as many of you have probably, why is it that some individuals capture our attention? Why is it so some individuals, regardless of merit, have such a hold on our, uh, on our attention? Um, why are there celebrities? Why are there Kardashians? Why are there Hin uh, Hiltons, uh, et cetera? 
Um, why is celebrity a sort of self-fulfilling uh, observation? Well, I think it's because they, this, this idea takes advantage of our natural inclinations as social beings towards following leaders and producing leaders. These are the qualities of performance, of leadership, and they all following them promotes social cohesion. So that's better to have a compass than not. And so even as we evolved with small social groups, it's better to have this common uh, uh, reality as de depicted by a leader uh, and maybe have these various modes of connected to each other through music and the arts uh, that help reinforce that social cohesion. So that's my idea is that celebrity really is uh, simply taking advantage of a, uh, of, a no of a known tendency of humans to agree with each other and to follow a, a leader. So this, uh, then we can take this idea, which is a connection between the arts and sciences, and maybe form a new discipline called applied celebrity to help uh, solve the, wor the world's uh, uh, dilemmas. So this, of course, is familiar territory. Many very famous faces have been have turned their celebrity towards very good, great goods, uh, whether it's providing water or, you know, a vaccine for COVID, or saving the rainforest um, for leadership. Uh, however, it is. Um, and several of these actually uh, graduated from Harvard. I think Natalie Portman in particular, not Bill Gates or Matt Damon. Uh, others are speakers, so noted uh, wonderful commencement speakers, Oprah Winfrey, of course, and J.K. Rowling. So uh, I just want to conclude and say, you know, all of these interesting questions, which the science knowledge uh, really only adds to the excitement, the mystery, and the awe of a flower. It only adds. I, I don't see how it subtracts. So that's basically my talk. And um, there's nothing new under the sun. This, is, uh, this relationship between the arts and sciences was understood partially, partly in the, you know, the 19th century. In the 21st century, our undergraduates, with a, by virtue of a new, uh, dis, a new journal, undergraduate journal called Ignisis, uh, you know, is meant to address the connections between the arts and sciences. Um, of course, uh, 8,000 years ago, Confucius told us how to live with each other, the arts, and Lao Tzu said how to live with the world, the sciences. So nothing's new under the, com under the sun. So basically human creativity makes connections in this evolving virtual reality model that we have of the universe, both inside and outside of humanity, and it always has. Creative works of early humans were already sophisticated and endured in us today. Their roots and awareness and representation of the world stretch back to the first animals to crawl from the sea. Emotional investment and meaning stretches forward through our connections in society and with the planet, becoming belief and conviction. And belief and conviction transform our awareness and enable navigation and exploration in an uncertain world of what lies ahead. So that's what I have to say. And I, I thank you um, for your time. I think we can take questions if, there's any, if anybody is still with us. So thank you for, uh, for, your, uh, for your patience. Thanks so much, Brian. I'm yeah, this was fantastic. Quite a journey. Um, Thank you. And we do have one question, but I'll, I'll just, um, there are a few things that really uh, caught my attention. Um, I think one is if we think of the moment we live now, where um, patients who are hospitalized uh, due to COVID have no contacts at all with any of the family members. And um, the work you showed about the social regulation of gene expression. Um, so that is, is quite concerning. Um, and, you know, as much as we knew the struggles those people are facing without being able to connect with any of their loved ones, um, they may even end up performing worse because of the conditions that they go through. Um, the second reflection is uh, the whole idea of biology of inequality. So we live in a very unequal world. We all know about the effects of the social determinants of health. And now we have a, a biology argument um, for how harmful um, the inequalities can be. And still, um, we don't have let's put it this way, the majority of the governments that don't make inequality their main focus on, in terms of social actions. And, and there is a, a huge cost for that. And we even have a biological ground for it. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I guess um, another reflection is 
when we think about how we interact with nature. Um, and uh, in fact, the first question addressed this. So I'll, I'll mention more when I read the question, but you know, knowing all of that, why do we act the way we act um, instead of favoring nature, favoring a harmful model of economic growth? And uh, I guess my last comment is about the celebrity. Unfortunately, we have celebrities who not necessarily influence us in a good way. So, um, you know, um, I understand your point, but I think we have to try to understand the other side of celebrity, which is to, that cause more harm than, than, than help. So, um, uh, so that brings us to the first question is from uh, um, Washington uh, Fajardo, who spent some time with us um, at Dr. Class. Um, so his question is about the economic dimension that would come from the knowledge that we are all nature. We're still struggling with a continuous and persistent aesthetics of development based on the extraction from nature and its alienation. What could be the rule of the economics in business education aiming for more ecological welfare and to foster a wealthy, healthy equity? Very easy That's question. A, a wonderful question. Uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, Marcia. And thank you, Washington, uh, for the question. You know, clearly, uh, I think the answer is probably self-evident that it's a, a matter of uh, short-term gains versus long-term sustainability. Um, and bringing the and bringing the long term measurement into the sphere of uh, you know of um, of the political leaders who are who apparently lack the will to be able to transform society and uh, through legislation uh, in a way that will really benefit the generations to come. I think that's that's really the the, the dilemma that we face. Uh, I don't know what the answer is, but I do think, and I am encouraged by the. Uh, by this very strong medical evidence of the impact of our uh, surroundings, our, our nature, our connections to nature and our connections to each other on public health. I think public health, in other words, is the common denominator. And I think that that has a measurable cost itself uh, in support systems uh, and in mortality rates and morbidity. Uh, I think that uh, if we could bring that together with the uh, you know, with with these other dimensions uh, having to do with our surroundings, with nature, and in the, the the political sphere, we would get someplace. And so that's why I think uh, that we uh, would do well to um, support, in a much greater degree than we have, uh, the uh, research of public health researchers in all of these contexts, both in the society with respect to discrimination, and also in nature with respect to the impact uh, of uh, you know, of, uh, of destruction basically in development. Um, so I think, I, as I say, you know, everything we touch touches us back, there's a cost. It's just not measured uh, in the matter of dollars this year or next year, but it's a longer term relationship. That's a tough one to get into your head, but I do think I am encouraged by the fact that we can actually measure this. So thank you for the great question. Okay, so now we have a question from Marco Moreno. How do you think that scientists can have an influence on politics and world leaders to translate all this knowledge into practice in public policies? Hmm. Another, great, uh, another great question. Honestly, I think if we could put together some of these elements that I've touched on, the power of celebrity uh, to emphasize the importance of science uh, to a broader public. So for example, I have participated twice in the Chile, uh, Chile's um, Congreso del Futuro. What that is, is the Congreso del Futuro is a, uh, it's a, a TED-like uh, series of uh, days in which presentations by experts all around the world are made, uh, they're live streamed uh, in a very high tech kind of beautiful, attractive setting, live streamed free on public television, and they're piped across all of all of Chile. So the public really tunes into this and it's a way to get science to the public. What that's resulted in is the creation, the, the, the mandate from the people for a ministry of science, which is new, which was created just a couple of years ago. I think in large part because of the vision of one particular science-minded senator, 
Gir um, Guido Girardi, and uh, those who uh, have participated, you know, in these uh, extraordinary talks. Uh, so the the Congreso Futuro is something we need in the United States uh, to, to to basically translate these uh, observations that I've made. What I've told you shouldn't be news to you. You know, we really should have this out in the public sphere so that folks realize that there is consequences of uh, our relationships with each other and our relationships with nature. So I think uh, celebrities could help us with that and like-minded uh, senators and the legislature could as well. And then of course, educators. And I obviously think that uh, education boosts the effects, uh, you know, of all of these things. So that's, that's my quick um, response, but uh, thank you. Okay. Okay, so now we have a question from Alan Wolf. Can you discuss how different cultures may rise or fall in their comparative abilities to cope with change? Hmm. Well, uh, that's, uh, I think that's actually a topic that has been addressed by others who know much more than I do. Uh, you know, I'd recommend Gun, Germs and Steel, you know, uh, by Jared Diamond. Uh, and others who, uh, it certainly is the case that cultures who haven't adapted uh, to changing climate, for example, have suffered the consequences. We had a wonderful talk at uh, the Harvard Museum of Natural History, co-sponsored by, by Dr. Class, of the uh, analysis of, of why uh, the, uh, the, the Mayans disappeared from, um, from middle Mexico at the time that they did. It turns out that uh, all these these great extraordinary uh, civilizations and pyramids and all just dis folks just walked away from them as far as we can tell and it looks like now we know that it was climate change that they failed to adapt to uh, they didn't adapt their crops and their ways of uh, depending on uh, on a particular stable climate I'm very concerned with that with respect to the Amazon uh, at the moment because I know because of uh, my discipline that the Amazon has been entirely grassland in the past you know. 10,000 years ago, it was one big savanna. What kind of ecosystem is there, rainforest or savanna, dramatically affects what kind of rainfall the entire continent gets, because that's what that dictates basically the, the, the patterns of uh, winds and rains. So we could change that uh, in a real, in a hurry uh, from and revert back to the savanna kind of uh, habitat if we're not careful. So that's, that's one example. And climate change in general is something that's, that's coming, obviously, and we can slow it or not. Uh, so it's up to us. Yeah, his but we book. Know, we, we know from history what the consequences are. Yeah, I think one of his books is called Collapse. Collapse. And the, the it's of. Collapse, yeah. And the very okay. last chapter of the book, I think he gives 12 reasons. And, and it's a mix between environment and demography. It's population growth and it's climate. Right. It, it's it's fascinating. Yeah. So That's if you, right. it's a it's a thick group it, it book. If you cannot read all the books, just read the last chapter. You're gonna get a very good picture. But all right. So now we have a question from a student, an international relations student. Uh, her name is Sofia uh, Olivares from Mexico, and her question is: um, Do you think it would be better to invest in cultural and social programs to help human development instead of economic growth focused programs, especially in vulnerable sectors and why? I think I know the answer, but. <laughs> yes, no, of course I do. Uh, that's uh, what can, one can certainly realize a much greater impact overall on society uh, by focusing the attention where it's needed. Uh, all of all of the society, not just in the poorest neighborhoods, they're, the entire city, for example, if we take a city as a unit, is affected by what's affecting the poorest sectors, right? And so it's not that, uh, I don't think that ec an, a, a strictly first economic uh, approach is really the, the, uh, the way to enable and empower people to take advantage of the economic uh, changes that you could then introduce. Social, I think, comes first. You have to introduce people to the idea uh, you know, of, um, of improving uh, that, that, that the world isn't, doesn't have to be this way. You know, there is a possibility of change. I think that has to be socialized first. So I agree with you completely. Uh, economics can follow. Um, I'm a Vermonter and there's an old Vermont saying that uh, the extension service here from the university would tell Vermont farmers how to farm better. And they would say, I'm not farming half as well as I know how to now. So I don't need any more knowledge. <laughs> so anyway, it's an old joke, but it's the same idea. You know, you'd really need to uh, focus on the social and cultural parts first so that folks can take full advantage, I think, of the economic programs that are then following. Mm 
-hmm. Maybe do this hand in hand. All right. So, so thank now, you. Great question, Sofia. Now we have another question from Mexico from Ilana and Rodrigo. Um, what type of spaces do you envision that can promote art and sciences in a more anonymous applied celebrity action? Hmm. Wow. Well, you know, um, I'm aware of a uh, well-known architect from Chile who transformed neighborhoods in by, oh no, this was Colombia. He transformed neighborhoods in Colombia by building a library in the middle of the poor neighborhood. And what the library produced was first a point of pride for the neighbors, but also a place where people could gather and express themselves. And it really, all the economics followed that uh, initiative. And it was a great idea. I think uh, by extension, one could create these kinds of art spaces, maybe connected to uh, you know, existing spaces, Perhaps they could even be, uh, perhaps they could be patronized or sponsored by a, a known artist of the reason of the region who feels pride of place, uh, and then uh, provide a venue for expression uh, of art. Of art. Uh, which, as Ed Wilson puts out, are the artists really are those who lead the vanguard. They're the ones who describe the world first. And it's the, we poor scientists, we slowly invent the tools so we can catch up and test small things at a time. But it, uh, I think uh, the artists uh, of the world really can, uh, can lead the charge this way. I think that that's uh, one way you could do it, by just creating simple spaces uh, uh, and maybe attract attention through the affiliation of um, you know, whatever groups or sponsors you could. But great idea. Okay. Now, Ines uh, Pelias from Mexico City. Um, so she's asking, do you think that art is influencing the research on COVID-19. Wow, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, if you were here, I would ask you that question. I'd turn it around. Um, hmm. I'm gonna think about that after this talk. Uh, well, if I may say something, I think we are seeing how art is making a difference in this moment that we live in, in mm -hmm. physical distancing and the amount of like live music and theater and um, bands that each person is playing on one place. I mean, the, the Rolling Stones was quite famous on this. And this is becoming viral, no pun intended, but um, it, this is uh, that people are realizing the importance of music, of dance, ballet, opera. I mean, I've never seen those things circling around as much as I'm seeing now. So I don't know if it's impacting decisions, but it people are realizing how art is so important for their state of mind in the moment that we're just stuck in a very confined space. But very good. I couldn't agree more. Actually, uh, you're absolutely right. I think uh, that certainly discovering these new tools and taking advantage of tools to be able to remain connected to each other, whether it's artists in different uh, cities playing at the same time or, or dance or whatever it is. I think those are lessons that we're going to carry with us after this. We're not going to forget how to use those tools. So uh, I also think that, for example, this very talk uh, and your participation is something that wouldn't have been possible before. Uh, you are all scattered around the world you know, but yet convened in a common space. Um, we won't forget how to do this. Uh, it's something that we could also bring celebrities in or whatever. You can have common ground for folks who, you know, for whom it would be difficult to be in the same room. Uh, so I think that uh, that's the flip side of this experience. And you're right, uh, Marcia, that's right. I'd forgotten for a moment that it is the artists, including the musicians especially, that have uh, made this uh, our moment really to to share and be connected and show how um, important all of this is to our mental health, which is the other big piece of this, right? And uh, that's because, that's why I've said, we're our social species. We are fundamentally social species. We've experienced a million years together living in these stressful environments and our, it's our connections to each other that made the difference. So of course that inf influences every aspect of our being. It's, it's the reason we can read body language. You can read the nuances in other people's faces. Um, you can tell from the tone of voice, all of these things just bespeak our connection to each other. 
So I, I think uh, this is our moment really to uh, take advantage of that. Uh, and when we can come back together physically, we'll have that new knowledge and I think a new power. Yeah, and, and I hope we learn from it. So um, one last question that comes from me and then you can answer that and do your closing remarks. But I fully agree that science is learning. Um, there's one thing intrinsic to science um, that maybe I missed, but I, I don't think you mentioned, which is uncertainty. So I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about how uncertainty actually plays a role in all this incredible journey that you told us. I mean, on one hand, maybe the, the presence of uncertainty can also um, be an additional stimulus for creativity and for even further um, uh, boosting the learning process. So I don't know, I may be wrong, but I wonder if you could reflect a little bit on how uncertainty plays a role in this beautiful story that you told us. Thank you, Marcia. No, I, absolutely. I think that, uh, I actually think that the, that the, the strongest, the most influential gift that our parents give us, and others can give them too, uh, other influential people when we're young, is confidence, believing in ourselves. And I think uh, it takes confidence to admit that you don't really know something, that you might, for sure, that you might have, you might need to keep an open mind until you have further observations and op an open mind that allow you to be convinced by somebody else or by enough evidence of one kind or another. So I think that's where creativity lies, really, is the willingness to open your mind to accept some novel observation that you'd never thought of before, make some connection you'd, ne you'd never made. I think that that's what's transformative. You know, I'm reminded uh, that uh, of, a, of a, uh, an experiment done by one of my uh, biology colleagues, Ben Silvesky, got quite a lot of press a few years ago. What he showed was that uh, young songbirds, young songbirds learn their songs from the, by hearing their parents, uh, and then they imitate them. And they, uh, as they're imitating them, they make, a, make, they make mistakes. Uh, and it turns out that um, there's an, actually a, a neurological circuit in their brains that causes them to make mistakes. And the, re the benefit is, is that some of their mistakes will be a better version than they heard. So they'll actually improve. Uh, so the, uh, I've given this lecture to the Berkeley College of Music and they love it there because the message is practice all the time. Don't be afraid of your mistakes because some of them will be an improvement on what you heard. And so that's the general lesson really is to uh, accept uncertainty. Just go for it. You know, you're going to make mistakes. Uh, you know, uh, as we say in, in, in taxonomy, my original discipline, this, de describe in haste and uh, revise at leisure. So, you know, just, uh, yeah, you just have to go forward, I think. Uh, Thank you. And that's the essence of learning. That's how we learn, that's right? It. It's by doing. It. So thank you so much, Brian. This was You're absolutely welcome. fascinating. And I want to thank everybody who joined us um, in the Zoom call. And I am very hopeful that the next time we have the director's talk, we can do this in person in the nice auditorium and we can actually see each other's face as you said, and understand our reaction. So have a good day, everybody. Stay safe, stay home, and stay well. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Get outside. <laughs>